when we talked with Michelle and uh, Melissa months ago about coming here, one thing I talked about wanting to do was meet with docents because you are the front line. You are the art army and you're the ones that uh, with all the effort of getting the work here, it's what happens when people get in here and the, the incredible way you're going to help explain the art in whatever way you explain it that's going to make such a difference to their lives. I mean, in our society, we need to elevate issues uh, because there frankly isn't a gender, a race, an ethnic group in this country around the world that hasn't at some point been persecuted or uh, by some group. And we need to be conscious of those things. And I'll talk later, but art is one of the chief ways that we help face these issues in a constructive way and learn how to deal with them. I'm sure you all have accomplished lots of things in your life. Uh, but uh, in the end, from my standpoint, what greater legacy to leave behind than having been a docent at this wonderful institution and having all these tours, and you know, never quite know when the way you talked about some work or whatever, these geniuses that had an aesthetic predisposition to create this amazing art, that you're the people that are the interpreters that help take that visual impact of the work, but help guide these younger people especially, and lots of people that aren't so young either that going through all we've gone through, need after pandemic and everything, need that hit of hope and, and dreams and ideals and feeling better about themselves and society. So thanks for being a dose and thanks for being here. Uh, often I'm asked, you know, what's your favorite piece? Or if the house were on fire, what would you take? And so it's easy to say, well, that one, right? Yeah. And that's probably true. So um, my first love is love of the artists of the Northwest. And while this is the best of the best of the artists in this country in the last 50 years, I always talk about the importance of supporting local artists. Because if we don't, and this applies to dance and music and theater also, if we don't support those folks, they won't be able to stay in our communities. So just because I have all this fancy stuff, my heart is with the regional artists and I keep buying lots of their work and think it's as good as anything. You know, there are a lot of regional artists that are oftentimes as good as some of these artists. But like many things in life, you've got to be at the right place at the right time for certain things to happen. And if everyone, just every artist wanted to just be in New York or Chicago or LA, then <laughs> who'd be left in our communities? But anyway, so I always preach that importance. Now, uh, I was on the board of the Portland Art Museum. I've been on 30 boards, just down to three now. And um, there was an exhibition of prints and multiples uh, that uh, was curated by a man named Gordon Gilkey. Uh, name unfamiliar to you, but he was the dean of the art program at the Oregon State University, our land grant school, 28,000 students, gruff old guy and mustache and whatever. And I'd put on some events honoring him, but he was one of those monuments men in World War II. And one of those men and women that did a wonderful job getting a lot of the Nazi looted art back to its rightful uh, owners. And he'd fly off to Belgium or France every few years and come back with a new lapel pin. And, but the point is, he had 20,000 prints, even more than I have now, although 18,000 were from students and he traded and whatever. But we created the Gilkey Print Center. He put on this exhibition. I came up, my mother closed the gallery. I was still committed to art of the region, but I was feeling a little adrift. In many ways, maybe the gallery was like a sibling rival. And my mother was a den mother, I mean, she, uh, uh, I mean, she was always there, but she worked. And um, so I thought this might be fun to veer off a little bit and buy a few prints. I went down to a gallery that specialized in works on paper and bought a, a small uh, Frank Stella, a Hockney, and then a Jim Dine, a heart, a skull, and a cross. And as I was leaving, I saw a Frankenthaler and Ellsworth Kelly and whatever, and I bought a few more. The prices were reasonable, and I just was having fun. I had a little binder I kept myself. I take an image of the work and what I paid and the addition number, nothing like the fancy database we have now that I don't have a clue how to operate, but I've got 13 people that work full time that do, that keep track of the 19,000 works in the collection. And uh, uh, I was on the board of the Art Museum at the University of Oregon. The director, David Robertson, asked if he could do an exhibition of these prints he heard I was collecting. I said, you bet. And uh, they picked out 56 works. Uh, I went down a few months later to the museum where I'd come, as you have, to this museum so many times for events and so forth. And it was very exciting to see the work. There were 56 works. Two had come from the house. The rest had been in storage. And if you ask, what were they doing in storage? Well, I had a mother that was a merchant, a gallerist, 
So I was there a million times when she'd say to someone, gee, you know, if something speaks to you and you like it, and you just don't want to be wall space, don't pass it up. Buy it. Put it under your bed. Rotate it. But if something speaks to you, you'll look back and maybe always regret you didn't buy it. So I'd kept buying art even though I didn't have any wall space, and I'd rotate things from the storage room I had and the house. But um, it was neat to see the work up in the gallery walls like these that are much bigger than most of our houses. And the way that Larry Fong, the curator, had arranged the work, just as the wonderful folks here, the way they arranged all the, the art here. And I thought this didn't get any better. And um, as I mentioned last night to the group, I think when you are lucky enough to have art around you, as I hope you all do, and other objects, you develop a very special relationship with the work. You wake up, you know, hello, Jeff Koons. You go to bed, good night, Jeff Koons. Uh, I think it's analogous to, let's say, um, uh, with sports figures. You know, if you're rooting for a, a football player, a basketball player, a golfer, a tennis player, or an actor, actress. You know, I mean, we've all seen Meryl Streep, you know, a thousand times in different movies and things and, you know, in a way think we have a special relationship with her in terms of knowing her. Do we really know her? No. Do we know her persona? Yes. So in the same way when you have art around you, you develop a very intimate relationship with it. So walking into that museum down in Eugene, I felt like I was walking into a room with friends, even though I didn't know any of those artists at that time. But the real seminal moment in getting on point as to why you're here and why I'm here is when people came in and they did all the things that we all do. They look, they frown, what's going on with that Julian Opie? Do I like it? Why do you do that? Uh, uh, and especially the kids. So a father came in with an eight-year-old boy and he was standing with his son in front of a work by Robert Longo. And Robert Longo did a series called Men in the Cities. And he took his models and he put them up on a wall and he got a tennis ball machine he started shooting tennis balls at him, and they all jumped around to avoid being hit by the tennis balls. He took photographs and did these images. So there's one called George or Eric, and it's a man like this, and I love the work, and they were standing in front of it, and I scooted on down next to that eight-year-old boy like you do when you give your tours, and I said, what's going on there? Is that guy dancing and having fun, or is he twisting in pain and about to collapse? Because for me, when I see Robert Longo's work, those moments that unfortunately sometimes are few and far between when everything in your life is perfect. There's a sunset, the air, you feel so lucky to be alive, whatever. Oh. Or, you know, you get up in the middle of the night or something and you hit something and stub your toe and you go, oh God, I'm in agony, you know? You know you're gonna survive, but you're consumed with you know, pain and emotion at that point. Anyway, I see his work, that fine line between being consumed by emotion in a wonderful way or a painful way. Anyway, he looked at it and he said, I think he's dancing, to which I said, as every one of you would have said, I think you're right. And every young person you bring in this exhibition, no matter what they say about, uh, you know, he's thinking about, uh, you know, going and getting a McDonald's cheeseburger. I think you're right. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, whatever it is, that's the point of art. That's what you do, is whatever anyone sees in this work is right for them. So when, when, when I uh, had him answer that, what came to mind was the fact that in the Northwest, we're very lucky to have a phenomenal relationship with the outdoors. I remember my ex-wife who grew up in Sacramento when she came to Portland the first time, she said, this is a forest. I said, no, this is a city with a lot of trees. You want to see a forest? I can take you to a forest. But in terms of Sacramento, which is more barren, Portland looked like a forest, right? Um, so anyway, um, uh, the point is we've got a wonderful relationship with the outdoors. But I think in Portland, as in every of the 140 uh, We've had museum, we've got 140 exhibitions in 110 cities, in every single city, every museum. Uh, there's a majority of the population that still thinks that museum is for someone else. Oh, that building, that's for some elitist few, that's for some, you know, special people. You have to, you know, have a college degree, you have to whatever. Instead of realizing this museum here is for every single person in this city and the county and, and far beyond. And so what I thought is, boy, wouldn't it be neat to combine my passion for buying this works on paper with a program that lent the work to university and regional museums with the assumption that the biggest museums wouldn't need my work. Now, in the meantime, we've had shows at some of the biggest museums too. But our real focus is regional and university museums to get amazing work by the best of the best artists to less served communities. I don't mean that in a negative way about your community, but I'm saying, you know, to see all this work, you'd have to go to the 
Metro, the Modern Museum of Art in New York. So I just saved you getting on that plane and having to, to fly there. So it's been really a, a joy for me. Now, uh, why this art? Well, if there's one statement from me you will remember, my rambling on here, it's that I believe that artists are always chroniclers of our time. I keep saying that with every interview, every speech. Okay, their job is to reflect the issues in society. And for those of you that taught art, let's see, you, let's see, didn't you tell me you taught art? One of you said you were teaching art. Who'd I talk to uh, over there? Well, Jane last night. But, um, I mean, think about it. Whether you talk about Egyptian art and the hieroglyphics, or you talk about the Aztecs, you talk about Chinese art, you talk about the caves in France with the horses, you talk about Michelangelo, Van Gogh, doesn't matter what period. Can, First, artists that are working that are alive are always contemporary artists. And second of all, their job is to reflect things that are going on in their society, whether it's Roman statues or whether it's, you know, Damien Hirst. No different than an editorial writer in the New York Times. They're supposed to hit us with themes. And ultimately, the job of every artist is to make us think. Because if you went to an exhibition and you left with no thoughts, then why did they go through all that work and why did the museum do all that work to put it on up? So that's ultimately the job of every artist. Now why these artists? Because like most of you, all of you, these are the artists of our time. These are post-World War II artists. They're doing work that relates to the themes we've grown up with and themes and issues we're facing right now. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, the work for a second, then I'm gonna get some help from uh, our team, and we'll also maybe get up and walk around a little bit so you don't just sit in the whole time. Um, what's important philosophically, I think, and this is where you are such key folks to this, really, I'm not trying to just praise you for the sake of praising you, I say this with every docent group, is I know that you have a lot of friends, and when they find out that you're a docent in the museum, I'm sure you've all been asked a million times as I have, well, you know, a lot of that crazy stuff in that museum. Why can't those artists just paint some nice fruit bowls and do some nice, nice paintings of the Mississippi River? It's so beautiful. Just paint the river and, and you know, some fruit bowls or some nice portraits and not this crazy Leslie Dill stuff and, you know, God, that pop art stuff. <laughs> That's art. Oh, God. So <laughs> what I always say about that is, first of all, all of these artists, in this case, once in a while there's someone that didn't go to art school, but virtually everybody here, to my knowledge, all went to art school and generally got a master's too. So they painted plenty of fruit bowls and mountain scenes <laughs> and portraits, okay? <laughs> now all of, you, uh, all of you went to school and you had art in grade school, didn't you? And you had art in high school? And maybe some of you did art in college, whatever, okay? And I'm sure that more than once you've all over the years, especially when you maybe some of you had kids, like I've got older kids and younger kids, you're at a restaurant and you get those little paper uh, things to keep them busy with crayons and you sort of, you know, draw on it too, right? Or you're on the phone talking to someone in your little pad of paper and you're taking a pen and making little images, right? So, I mean, we're all artists, right? Okay. Now, have any of you had work that's been in this museum? Oh, okay. Well, we're all artists, but the point is to get in this museum and these bigger museums, two principal things have to happen. So these are bullet points, two, I think. That is, first of all, you've got to have a burning message inside you, a passion about some thoughts or that you want to get out. And in this case, instead of being an editorial writer for the New York Times, you're an artist. So you've got this burning passion inside you that wants to get out, that you're willing to make, whether it's a painting, a print, a sculpture, whatever, and you're willing to open up your guts and put that work on display and have everybody like you look at it and criticize it or praise it or whatever. And it takes a lot of guts, you know. We're looking at the people that have all been accepted. Think about the thousands and thousands of artists that are doing a good job putting art out and maybe it's not being received so well, it's heartbreaking. Okay, so you've got to have guts. Second of all, you've got to do it in a different way. Now, Andy Warhol does all these portraits. We've had portraits since, you know, right after, you know, uh, on the eighth day, I have this on good authority, you know, God rested on the seventh and Adam and Eve were born right there. Next day, they sort of started making portraits of each other. Anyway, the point is portraits have been around a long time, okay? Nothing new about portraits. But if you look at Andy Warhol, he has his brand. It is unique way he did and what he did. If you look at every artist in here, and that distinguishes them. 
So first, you've got to have that passion to get that message out, and second, you've got to do it in a different way. Because if these were all uh, a knockoff of Picasso's, that might be an interesting exhibition. You know, let's see what everybody else would do, you know, modeling. Uh, uh, I use this analogy about writing. Uh, I was a literature major at the University of Oregon, and that Cipriani's, uh, no, it's that uh, Harry's, uh, the, in Venice, they have a Hemingway uh, contest every year for uh, our, uh, writers that write like Hemingway. And, uh, you know, so let's say you had some friend and they came to you and said they wanted to write the great American novel. And they come to you later and, uh, and they say, will you read it, will you read it, and you read it. And it's really good, it's a great storyline. They say, what do you think? And you say, well, you know, it was really, I liked it. And you know, you really have the cadence and the wording and the style of Hemingway. And they say, well, you know, I went online I looked at what author has consistently sold over the longest period of time in our current, and Hemingway's right at the top, so I thought I'd emulate his style. I said, well, that's good to do, and there is that competition for Hemingway knockoffs. But if you want to write the next great American novel, you've got to have your own style, your own words, your own themes. We've had a Hemingway. So back to these artists, they've got to have their own unique way of presenting their ideas. And that's plenty tough because a lot of great things have been done before them. So, uh, any questions? And we'll talk a little about the art. Okay. Uh, because we're in this room, uh, I've talked already a couple times about the, the Warhols and the stuff here because we're here, but I think uh, we'll, I'll talk about this stuff here again, but then I think we'll move around a bit and have a, a couple of the gals that, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, William talk about some of the other art so you get some different perspectives and points of view. A key thing, I think, for you to stress to all of your friends when they make that question about abstract art, I don't understand it, whatever, is to say to them, give them this example which I use. Uh, there are probably some of you here who are really, really good cooks. But for the rest of us, you go to a restaurant and you try some new food and you love it. And you're tasting it and you say to your husband, wife, partner, friend, whatever, good, this is fabulous. Now, unless you're really, really into cooking, you'll know, probably sit there and say, let's dissect it. How was it made? What temperature was it cooked at? How much butter did they use? What were the ingredients? Now, maybe if someone's a real chef, they'll start thinking that way about what spices and how they put it together. The rest of us, we just love it. I'm not thinking about it. I'm in, enjoying it. You hear some new music, and you get into the beat of some new music, whatever. Again, unless you're a real music person, you're thinking about, well, how would, where's the synthesizer, and how did they record it, and what was happening when, and maybe the music, the, whatever. The rest of us, we just love the music. You don't sit there and say, well, what's going on there, and how was it made, and so forth. But somehow with visual things, we are conditioned differently. When we see things around us, we're so visual, if we see something you don't understand instantly, we tend to get all frustrated. Just think about it. We don't do that with other senses, but with visual things we do. So part of what I try to suggest to people is, you know, when you come into a museum, turn off that brain, okay? Don't torture yourself. Just look at the stuff and feel it. Just let yourself go. No different than if you're going for a hike outside. You're not sitting there thinking about, well, what's the evolution of this plant, and what did it come from, and over time, how... <laughs> You're just enjoying the walk, the air, the river, the, uh, the, the, the flora and fauna, and so forth. So a key thing is to tell people, well, relax, let yourself go. And if you do, just as I'm sure happens to each one of you, something in this exhibition will suddenly grab you and speak to you. So let's start off with uh, the, the ones that are in this room that we can talk about right here. Uh, and let's talk about Andy Warhol, because uh, 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 he's so prominent here. Uh, so Andy Warhol was born in uh, Pittsburgh uh, to uh, uh, his mother and father um, had come from Slovenia. They were a very religious, part of the Catholic Church. The sect that they sort of belonged to was called Ruthenian, uh, sort of a, 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 a cultural group within the Slovenian history. And uh, father was a carpenter, mother was a teacher, uh, two older brothers, uh, poor family. Uh, she did other uh, housekeeping, other things too, and so forth. And, uh, 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 Andy Warhol, the name was Warhola. He changed his name later. We went to New York and applied for a job. They somehow left the last letter too off, and he just stuck with that. But um, he uh, got into art in grade school. His mother got him in some art classes. He really excelled at that and liked it. 
but he was a sick, sickly boy. He had a skin condition and just was frail. And in fact, in seventh grade, he had to be kept home that year because he wasn't well. His mother, to keep him busy, uh, bought a lot of um, movie magazines to let him just thumb through those. So there were two, in his grade school years, there were two big influences. First, the church. He talks about going to church on Sundays and sitting there on these hard wooden pews for like four and five hours. He'd be bored to death and he'd be sitting there, you know, and what would he be looking at? He'd be looking at the priest and the altar and behind the altar, what do you have? You had all these icons on the wall. You'd have Christ and Joseph and Mary and the whole group there in one little gold frame, icon after icon after icon. So image after image after image. Next, that seventh grade, he's home that year, looking at those movie magazines. He becomes infatuated with Hollywood and publicity and stardom. He writes 25 actors and actresses for autographs. The only one that sent him a signed autograph was Shirley Temple, which he cherished. So the next big hint there is think about movies. Movies are image after image after image. And celebrity status and so forth. His father died when he was a freshman in high school. His father's last wishes were that his youngest son finish college. So when he was 17, a junior in high school, he announces to his mother that he wants to become an artist. She wisely says, Andy, it's tough to make a living as an artist, but why don't you become a commercial artist? Because there's always jobs doing commercial art. So he goes to Carnegie, Institute of Technology that's now known as Carnegie Mellon University and he enrolls and he gets a degree in pictorial design. His best friend is a man named Philip Perlstein and I'm lucky that he and Philip uh, um, exchanged drawings, two of which I have, that uh, he gave Philip and Philip gave him some and then Philip's heirs eventually sold it so I have some early, early work of Warhol that's pretty phenomenal. He did another small drawing that he gave his mother. She died, she gave it to John, his brother. He sold it and we have that. I like buying early work of these artists because it helps show how they evolve and grow. It uh, helps me and I think those of us that don't have art history degrees really see the, 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 the maturity of, of, of an artist. So he, um, uh, he and Philip Perlstein uh, every couple of months would go to New York. They wanted to go to the art epicenter in this country and and they'd make their way there and they'd go to all the museums and the galleries and go back. And by the time his senior year in the spring, he started knocking on some doors to try to line up a job because he wanted to move to New York when he graduated. And there's a famous story about the art editor of Glamour magazine. And he gets an appointment with the editor and he goes to see him. And he's sitting there with his white shirt that he talks about was all crumpled and he had khaki pants that were all sort of dirty and crumpled. And he was a, you know, uh, he'd worked during college at a, a department store in downtown Pittsburgh and did their store windows. So he was making some money that way to help pay for him going to school and he also got a lot of, uh, that was another shaping uh, force of doing displays as he did later in New York to help make some money. Anyway, he opens up his sketchbook to show the art editor some work and out crawls a roach which it was suggested later he put it there on purpose to sort of show the, the art editor he was a poor boy, needed a job. And of course the art editor was sympathetic and said, hey, this stuff looks pretty good, so when you graduate, come see me. And yes, he did get a job. Um, so right after college, moved to New York and uh, over the next really 10 years, became the most important graphic artist in New York. And he did a lot of ads for shoes. So a lot of the early work, we have 1,488 Warhol things. A lot of the early work he did uh, in, in uh, our shoes and ads and things which relate to what he was doing professionally. In 1957, he won an Advertising Age Award of the Year for a campaign for I. Miller Shoes, which was the equivalent then of Prada or, or uh, uh, you know, the, the expensive lady shoes now. Uh, so during that time, he was making a fair amount of money. He bought one townhouse, bought a second townhouse. His mother suddenly shows up on the door with a suitcase and three cats. That's why he does lots of cats. Uh, and she lived with him till just before she died when she moved back to uh, uh, Pittsburgh to be with her other kids to sort of die there. Um, but he was still frustrated, even though he was being successful as a commercial artist, going to all the galleries, going to all the openings, he wanted to be recognized as a fine artist. 
he had some exhibitions of sort of his shoes and cats and uh, other stuff that just didn't resonate with anybody. So finally he comes up with a new idea. He thinks of doing sort of a cartoon-like character with a bubble and some words. And he was very close to the, the manager of the Castelli Gallery, which was the leading gallery in town. So what does he do? He goes and takes this painting of the Castelli Gallery and says, look at this. And the guy says, wait a second. He goes in the back, pulls out another painting and says, look, another guy named Roy Lichtenstein came here a month ago with the same idea. We thought it was great and he's in our gallery. So if you want to uh, get in our gallery, you got to do something else. He talks to a guy named Henry Geldzhaler, who was the curator that really helped bring the pop artists some credibility. He talks to some other gallery owners, and they say to him, look, stop trying to do this other stuff. Do work about yourself. You know, when you grew up, what did you do? What do you eat? What do you do for entertainment? And when he was growing up, they were poor. He had tomato, Campbell's tomato soup for lunch every day. There you go. And that's how that first set of soup cans came to be. He created those soup cans. Uh, no gallery in New York would, would show them, but there was a gallery in Los Angeles called the Ferris Gallery run by a man named Irving Blum, who liked pop art from New York. And he had several shows of the big pop artists. I mean, now they're big, then they were nobody. And uh, three of the soup cans were sold for like 100 bucks a piece, but then uh, Irving Blum decided he should keep them all together, had to call a couple of his best clients and say, I'm not gonna let you buy those. He kept them all. He donated half about 20 years ago to the Modern Museum, and they paid him 10 million for the other half. Today, that set would be incalculable with what his prices have been. So as we say, the rest is history with Andy Warhol. Now, uh, let me finish up with him, and then we'll get up and walk around. Um, so he was, in essence, I think probably, the, in hindsight, the, the, the drum major of the pop art movement. Now, what was the pop art movement? I mentioned 15, 20 minutes ago that artists are always chroniclers of our time. So let's think about these artists. Andy Warhol finished in 1949, came to New York, where Lichtenstein got his uh, uh, master's in 1949, uh, undergraduate in 47 from Ohio State University. So Ellsworth Kelly, uh, where Lichtenstein both served in the Army, uh, where Lichtenstein served in, a, in an art department of the, uh, of the Army. Uh, uh, Warhol was a tiny bit younger, so he didn't serve in the army. But I mean, they all came to New York mainly in those early 50s. So that whole melting pot. So let's think about what's going on then. They're chronicles of our time. And what I'd suggest to you is the biggest single change in society. The men and women were in the service came back. Levittown started sprouting up. A big movement from the East Coast to the West. Suburban, cars, whatever. But the biggest single change in society was, I believe, the advent of television. Okay. So my father grew up where they'd go Saturday morning to a theater. There'd be a movie released to 2,000 theaters across the country at the same time. There certainly were newspapers from the 1880s and 90s, and they had advertising. But nothing like television where visually marketing people could help in very subtle and not so subtle ways convince us to drive that Bel Air Chevrolet to use Clairol hair products, to smoke Marlboro cigarettes and be macho. Change society. I wish these folks were here now to tell us what to do about these smartphones. They think we're being bombarded then by information. Nothing, okay? So if you think about pop art from the word popular culture, what was Roy Lichtenstein and Warhol and Jasper Johnson, Ellsworth Kelly and Jim Dine and Frank Stella and Rauschenberg all showing us? They were all dealing with consumerism, materialism. How does the individual maintain their sense of self when you're being manipulated and bombarded with messages? Not that that's bad to see all the stuff that's out there for us to, to buy and look at and go to. The second thing they were doing, when I said earlier, they've got to have a passion inside them and they got to do it in a different way. So if you think about all these kids in school, and yes, they were learning about, you know, Mondrian and Marshall Duchamp and Van Gogh and Rubens and Rembrandt and all the way back to the Greek and Roman and everybody, right? But the artists that they were excited about were the counterculture artists, right? Like every young group. It's not the established artists. And in the art world, right in that late 40s and early 50s, when these first group of pop artists were coming of age, 
It's the abstract expressionists that were setting the art world on fire. The Jackson Pollock, the Rothko. Okay. And what were those folks doing? They were reflecting the, a big change in the 30s and 40s, which was Freud and Jung, and suddenly our learning about, thinking about our dreams at night and what they mean and what really is going on in our subconscious and so forth. The world was consumed with all these new ideas. Are these crackpot doctors and crazy folks? Or gee, is there something to all this? So those artists were reflecting those things. Jackson Pollock would throw all that paint down. No plan, just throw it all around like crazy. Now the established critics, curators, museum directors thought that stuff was just crap. <laughs> That's just shitty stuff. We're not going to show that stuff in our museum. That Rothko, that other, horrible. And yet the, the, the Andy Warhols and the Jasper Johns and elsewhere, they were ecstatic by that stuff. They were breaking open the art world. They were saying, let's get rid of those old rules. But suddenly they had to figure out what they were going to do because they couldn't do a Rothko painting. They couldn't do a Jackson Pollock painting because they were already doing that. So they looked at the impact of societal change with the TV. They had to do something, abstract, something different than the abstract expressionists. So suddenly Jasper John said, hey, these two ale cans I drink from, why aren't those art? He said, let's look at that American flag. Why don't we look at objects like that as art instead of just a flag? Now these guys, you know, it's not like they had this all figured out. I mean, the success came years later then. They weren't being accepted by anybody either. When Andy Warhol did his stuff, Jasper Johns, those people, the people just thought it was horrible. Just like they thought the abstract expressions were horrible. It's only now we put them on these pedestals that go to the sky. So they were doing two things. One, building upon the freedom that the abstract expressionists had opened up for them. And second, reflecting materialism, consumerism, and standing back and saying, and they all fed upon each other, because they would all see each other and, and know each other, some had closer relationships and whatever, and they were breaking down what art is. Andy Worrell's philosophical theme was the democratization of art, key word. That art, like we start off saying, is for everybody, not just in some buildings and for some elitist few. That was a huge change then. If you look at the art museums around the country, they had the civic leaders that were the sort of hoi-toi people in each community. They weren't focused on getting the public all in. They were doing sort of these museums of art for sort of themselves, the high society, whether it was, you know, San Jose, San Francisco, you know, Des Moines, doesn't matter what community it was in. Whoever thought they were the cream of the crop, that's who the cultural things were for, not like we're doing now. So Andy Worrell, in terms of technique, loves screen print because it's the most elementary of making a big addition. Uh, he never did paintings in the way that we look at paintings. The works he did on canvas were screen print on canvas, and the works on paper were screen print on paper, because he liked doing lots of them. He wasn't selling these things for any big money. Years later, years later, they start going for a little bit more. So uh, uh, a fabulous time, popular culture, popular art, reflecting the themes of the time, the advent of television and marketing, the booming economy, that was their job. The last thing I'll talk about real quickly is the Neopop. Uh, Patrick Shaw, the wonderful curator from the Taubman, how that happened is the director had called up, she'd heard about me and said, hey, can we really borrow a bunch of art from you? I said, sure. She said, well, let me send my curator out. He came out for three days. And while we have at the warehouse the 19,000 things on racks and whatever, we have 150 binders in William's office where the curators come, they pull down the binders and can look at all the different artists' work. There's something tactile there that's better than things on screen. And he came up with this idea of this show. I said, it's great, wonderful. And uh, he did a good job. He unfortunately passed away about uh, four months after the show closed at Roanoke, Virginia at the Taubman Museum. Uh, but he did a great job. So uh, that word neopop has been used a bit. He liked it a lot. And what his idea about the show was this. If, he, if someone asked, well, who were the greatest artists of our time that were older, and who are the greatest artists of our time that are a bit younger, uh, that's what the show is about. So you have the big established artists, and then you have the newer ones like Richard Prince and, and uh, uh, oh, the Roger Shimora and Julian Opie and Damien Hirst and others. Now, these folks are in their you know, 50s and 60s. It's not like they're 22-year-old emerging artists. Uh, but he wanted to see how these newer neo-pop artists build upon the legacy of the pop artists. So a neat combination of, of, of work.
So with that, I think, uh, any questions? And maybe we'll get up and maybe have uh, uh, Sarah and Julia talk. Yes? You bet. I didn't want to take too much time here, but... So Jeff Koons, I've watched him over the years, and uh, I mean, I must admit, I think i got a pretty good eye, but there are times I also think that some of these artists are... Well, first, there, there are several of them here that are brilliant marketers, totally different than the Jasper Johns and Lichtenstein. And, I mean, they got in and worked and worked, and their galleries did their work, but, I mean, Damien Hirst made that big deal a few years ago about that $100 million skull with all the diamonds. Who knows what it was really worth, but it sure got tons of publicity. And they're brilliant at marking themselves in ways that are much different than the early pop artists. But Jeff Koons has been quite a life. He was married to an Italian stripper for a long time. There are all sorts of images of them in various stages of, uh, of romantic eroticism. Anyway, uh, uh, and you know, he does these big balloon dogs and these topiaries and things and whatever. And I think part of me, as I watched him over the years, thought, is this guy just pulling a... Uh, is he sitting there just laughing inside and saying, I'm fooling the whole art world? Or like the, art, like the Warhols and these others, were they pushing the art world in ways that the established world, art world didn't think was very good? Well, actually, I think he's really brilliant. It uh, doesn't mean everything he does is not whatever, but he, he's, he's taken what Claus Oldenburg did of taking ordinary objects. You'll see downstairs a potato, for instance. We can talk all sorts of themes about it, but, but who would have ever thought that a potato would be art? But Claus Oldenburg was trying to build upon that theme like his peers, that art's all around us. It was a natural for Andy Warhol being a graphic artist. He was trying to shake us up and say, hey, when you go in that grocery store, look at all the packaging. That's all art. Look at the way they do the labels and whatever. I mean, art's all, not just in these buildings. So Jeff Koons, he, uh, these big balloon dogs and the uh, topiaries and all the things he's done. But again, I think he's brilliant. Now, I've not made a big effort to meet a lot of artists. Um, I've got a big business to run. I've got a 24-year-old daughter, just finished at USC, has a degree in real estate and art history. <laughs> Never thought that would happen. I've got a 21-year-old 20, like some of you. I remember, I remember the only time I knew exactly what to do about raising kids, and it was very defined, was before I had them. <laughs> and then you have your kids and you realize how humbling it is and you don't have a clue what to do, okay? Anyway, I'd be in a Safeway years ago when I was single and I'd see some mom with a kid. One would be in the grocery cart, one would be on the floor of, the, of, the, of Safeway hand on the disgusting floor in the mouth. I thought, well, that's a horrible mother. And then suddenly I have my two little daughters that now are 24 and 21. We're in Safeway. <laughs> They're on the floor, hand in their mouth. And I'm saying, God, help me just get through the store without their bursting in tears and people thinking I'm a terrible father. <laughs> but anyway, they all survived. I did realize that over all the years we grew up in caves and teepees and in the forest and whatever, and somehow people survived with a lot of dirt. Anyway, uh, the point is that uh, that, uh, uh, where, where was I now? I lost myself. You were asking what? Uh, what, what now? The gazing balls. So with Jeff Koons, uh, again, I've not met many, I didn't make a big effort to meet a lot of the artists because their work's so important to me, okay, that I didn't want to meet one of them, that I developed this wonderful relationship and construct, and if they were just rude and a jerk, I'd sit there every time being torn about loving the art but thinking the person was not very nice. I have met a lot of these major artists now, and frankly, they've all been wonderful to me. Maybe because of the program we have, I'm certainly not their, I may be their biggest collector in terms of the amount of things, but certainly the other folks spend far more money. But uh, I was invited to a uh, uh, Washington, D.C. to a group, there's a group that uh, has uh, art in embassies around the country. And I went to the State Department where I'd never been, pretty impressive place, as I'm walking through all the security, I see a fellow about, oh, over there, and I went over to him and I said, are you Jeff Koons? He said, yes. I said, well, my name's Jordan Schnitzer. I have about, I don't know, 70 or 80 of your things. I've done a good job getting your work to around 30 museums. I've done a lousy job letting you know where the exhibitions have been. And I'm gonna do a better job letting all the artists know where the exhibitions are. And uh, I said, I love your prints and multiples. I have a big teaching collection, and whatever. He said, well, you know, I've been thinking about doing some more prints. Since you are the biggest print collector in the country and you work with all the publishing houses, where should I go? I said, well, uh, Two Palms Press in New York, David and Evelyn Lazary do a brilliant job. 
You're in New York, they're in New York. Also, Gemini in LA would be great for you. But here's uh, David Lazary's number. I called David, gave him Jeff Kuhn's number. And by God, they've done three series now, which I've bought. And, uh, and I've spent a bit of time with Jeff Kuhn's. And he's been now, I don't know if he's, certainly his lifestyle is different than it was when he was younger. But he was a very smart and good sense of humor and down to earth and been, been wonderful. So this series here he did, and I first saw these that they uh, sent me the images, I thought, oh, I don't know, it seems a little screwy to me. But then as I looked at them and became entranced with them and then met with him and he read about what he was doing and then actually heard him talk about it, uh, he grew up in Pennsylvania and he uh, grew up on a farm. And he remembers as a young boy when he'd be driven home, uh, he would go by other people's farms and they all had these blue gazing balls in their yard. I remember my uncle uh, Gordon and Aunt June, my mother's older sister and husband, in their backyard they had a gazing ball. It dawned on me just the other day. And I remember going and looking at that and being fascinated as a little kid because when you look at a gazing ball, what happens? You see yourself. And you see this um, distorted view, like a 180 degree view of what's behind you. I mean, it's like the original selfies, right? Like they had downstairs, if you think about it, right, okay? <laughs> And so what he did is he's always fascinated, as all these people, about observation. Uh, Roy Lichtenstein, uh, most important statement he made was Hoyt Sherman, his professor at Ohio State University, said was, he taught me how to see. And ultimately that's our job when we come in here. You're helping all these young, whether it's two or 102, people see the art. It's the process of observation. That's what this is about. So here, very cleverly, he went to Corning Studios Glass Lab to get to figure out how to get that, uh, that blue hone the way he wanted. Each one, he said, cost 300 bucks. It took like four months for him to figure out how to do it. And then he took these amazing paintings. There are six images in this set. So this is Mona Lisa, the most famous painting in the world, a Picasso one. There's a, a Gauguin one I have in my bathroom with a gazing ball on it. So what he's done very cleverly He's taken an image we all know. So you see that, you walk up to it, it's welcoming. He seduces us with an image that's really familial to us, very familiar to us. But then he has that ball there, and you think, well, that's odd. Why is he doing that? And you just go look at it, and suddenly, what do you see? You see yourself. So what he's doing is bringing you into the Mona Lisa. Pretty obvious, pretty fun. And therefore, he's making us think about observing how we look at art, the whole power of observation. Very clever, very clever. So with that, uh, so I don't take too much more, how are we doing time-wise? We bring gals up, do a couple of things. I have to strap all these uh, mics onto myself. Um, I just wanted to, to um, yeah, I'm Julia. I'm the person that Jordan referenced. I did my PhD in early, early German prints. Uh, just to build on something that Jordan mentioned in terms of Andy Warhol um, and his democratization of art, I think one of the things that's difficult about this show from an education standpoint is that in general, printmaking practices and processes are actually quite confusing for a general audience. So if we look at some of the Warhols that are made in screen print, like this series of six works here, the Marilyn Monroe that you see on the wall over there, and many others. This is one of, uh, this is really Warhol's favorite medium of printmaking is silk screening or screen printing. This is the single only method of printmaking that does not require a printing press. A printing press is a very expensive object. They can be tens of thousands of dollars. A hydraulic press is upwards of $100,000. So a, a silk screen, you can make a print with just a screen that has a wooden frame around it, and it truly is a very efficient and democratic way of making a print. So I think that's an interesting um, way of breaking down uh, at the level of medium some of the points that Jordan was making about Warhol. Um, I know we only have a few minutes, so I think I just wanted to introduce myself and share that thought that I had, but I think I'll pass it over so that my colleagues have a minute to say something before we depart. various microphones here. We've got a lot of technology today. Okay. 
Good morning, and thank you so much for sharing your time with us this morning. Um, I am also a research associate with the Jordan Schnitzer Family Foundation, along with my colleague Julia, who you just heard from. Um, one thing I just wanted to share with you, likewise, when you're thinking about giving tours, perhaps, for this exhibition, is sort of the fact that this show is actually a fairly conceptually rigorous show in that it's you know referencing these very specific art historical moments. So I thought I'd just give my thoughts on you know what does it mean to be pop and neo pop perhaps in thinking through something like this uh, Lichtenstein print that's behind me. So pop art specifically in America really came about um, in reaction to abstract expressionism which was, um, you know, went from being very sort of uh, critically, you know, hated to becoming the national aesthetic of the United States um, by the late 50s. So when we say abstract expressionism, we mean artists like Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, Helen Frankenthaler, and these were individuals who were really, you know, painting um, non-representational images that were gestural, that were emotive, um, and it was sort of a celebration of the high modernist idea of the, you know, artistic genius. So when artists like Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein came about in the early 1960s and started incorporating commercial art into their paintings, it was really offensive to the art world in general, the sort of collapse of high and low aesthetics into, um, you know, bringing the, the comic book, for example, into painting was really offensive at the time. Um, and just to share an anecdote of how offensive this initial gesture of, you know, this founding of pop art was, in 1959 in Life magazine, Jackson Pollock was profiled with a headline that read, is he the greatest painter in the United States? And then five years later, Roy Lichtenstein appeared in Life magazine um, and with the headline that read, is he the worst artist in America? So truly people like had no idea why something as banal as comic books or, you know, in, uh, in certain cases, you know, like common images from movies were being represented. But when you kind of take a step back and look at what Roy Lichtenstein was doing, you'll see that he's actually very intentional and reflecting on the moment. Um, so just to briefly kind of clarify his process, he would sketch something out. He would take a comic book, for example. He would sketch or frame certain aspects of the comic book. So he wasn't directly copying, but he was kind of recomposing those images. He would then transfer that sketch to a projector and then project his own drawing onto a canvas where he would trace it and then fill it in. And one thing you'll know from you know, pop art that's become kind of ubiquitous are those bende dots. Um, but when you think about their appearance in, you know, Roy Lichtenstein's work, it was a printing technique that was used to, you know, create mass distribution of very cheap leaflets and things like that to create the appearance of shading. And that was the technique developed in the 1800s. So when Roy Lichtenstein is taking this kind of mass-produced commodity sort of shading technique and hand-painting it on a canvas, he's really showing how that kind of, you know, technique had become inculcated into his psyche or into his language, the language of, you know, of his, you know, visual expression as an individual of the 20th century, just in the way that all of us are. Um, so really, pop art of the 60s was about kind of this collapse of high and low, about the, you know, the mechanization of artwork. And then when we see it later in neo-pop, which is a much more sort of, um, it's not, I wouldn't say it's necessarily as recognized of a art movement like pop. It's really more of a phrase to, you know, describe a collection of artists like Coons or Murakami, um, who are using those ideas of commodification, mechanization, of using commercial imagery, but in a contemporary context. So that could be something to think about as you're starting to, you know, show people around the galleries. But all, all in there, in the sake of time. Yes? 
Yeah, it actually um, comes from the name of the person who invented this technique. So when you, when you see Ben Day diets, his name was Ben Day, actually, and then it just kind of collapsed into a single word. Um, it was invented in 1879, and it was a way to use less ink so that like, if the dots are very close together, it appears darker, and as they you know, disperse, it, they, it appears to be lighter in shade. Yeah, and there, there's actually a good example behind me here in this Murakami, um, but in a more kind of, I believe this is, yeah, uh, in a more abstracted form. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much again.